wildfires raging in California. Two of them exploded in size with frightening speed. The homes, the homes are becoming There have been harrowing accounts of people literally abandoning their vehicles and getting out to run for their lives. Please visit the Fire Safe Marin website and subscribe to our newsletter for more information. So tonight's topic is evacuation and warning, how to survive a wildfire. Our chief speaker is Central Marin Fire Battalion Chief Todd Lando. This is not a lecture series, so we encourage you to participate but by providing your questions in writing through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We have a very high number of attendees tonight and a lot of content. So questions that we cannot address during tonight's conversation will be answered and posted on the Fire Safe Marin website in writing. The website will include a link to the recording of tonight's presentation, which is actually posted on our Fire Safe Marin YouTube channel, which includes a lot of very interesting additional educational videos. We do ask that you keep your questions related to tonight's topic if you're participating on Facebook, you can email questions to info at firesafemarin.org. Todd's presentation will be followed by Dr. Shannon Mar Dewey, who will recount her evacuation experience during the Paradise Fire. You will also be able to ask her follow-up questions. We'll conclude the tonight's webinar with some suggested actions that you can take right now that will help you make yourself safer in the event of a wildfire. When we've completed all of that, we'll have an additional 30 minutes of questioning in kind of a round table where you can speak to all of our panelists. With that, I would like to introduce Battalion Chief Todd Lando. Thanks, Rich. Appreciate the introduction. I, I, I'm Todd Lando. I'm the Wildfire Hazard Mitigation Specialist, a Battalion Chief with Central Marin Fire Department. I'm the Vice President at Fire Safe Marin. I've been active uh, as a firefighter in, in the wildfire prevention community in Marin for almost 30 years. Um, really appreciate all of the attendees. I see over 500 attendees on Zoom, and I'm not sure how many are on Facebook Live right now, although we'll probably get that number pretty soon. Um, I, I hope everybody is able to sign into Facebook because we've, we've reached the maximum that we can have with us uh, via Zoom. I'm going to share my screen here and uh, move through a, a, a presentation with, uh, again, opportunities for you to ask questions in writing. We're going to pause about a third of the way through this um, to introduce our guest speaker and take some questions. So let's get started here. So I, I ordinarily open up discussions, any discussion about wildfires and especially evacuations in Marin with with a, uh, uh, a slide, of a group of slides related to the fire history in Marin. We're gonna bypass that today. I don't think our history is important to uh, illustrate that we're at risk of wildfire because we have what's probably the, the uh, second largest wildfire in the last 50 years in Marin burning as we speak. We have several communities evacuated in Marin. 
um, uh, and several more at risk from the Woodward Fire and the Point Reyes National Seashore. So, I, you know, I, I, I know that's why we have so many attendees tonight. I know that the Bay Area fire situation is dire. And suffice it to say, this, this is not new. We have a long history, hundreds of years of history of wildfires in this community. <sighs> when we discuss wildfire preparedness, especially how it relates to evacuation, we, we like to break it down into, uh, it, you know, three topics, ready, set, go. This is a, 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 a national program that follows the ready, set, go mantra, and it, it's important. It, it works. It, it, it helps us keep organized and, and come up with a, a solution that works for individuals for preparedness. The ready is discussing preparedness, things you do in advance of a fire. Being set is the situational awareness that you need to have when a wildfire is burning in your neighborhood, like virtually everybody in the Bay Area or Northern California right now, uh, oh, but really anytime during uh, fire season. Uh, and go refers to going early, making the decision to leave. When's it time to evacuate? The preparedness portion, what you're doing tonight, attending this, uh, this webinar, or if you're watching it later on uh, uh, pre-recorded, uh, you're taking a step towards readiness. Uh, readiness can also refer to things like hardening your home, making your home more resistant to igniting from embers, can be uh, maintaining the vegetation around your home or creating defensible space around the outside of your home can be things like community organizing, joining with the Firewise USA program or working with your neighbors to reduce wildfire risk in your community. Tonight, we're talking only about the first one, your personal preparedness, your safety and your family's safety and getting yourself out of your community when a fire's nearby. <sighs> so we're gonna move into discussion of, of what being set, what situational awareness is when we're referring to a wildfire. A big part of this has to do with being aware of the weather. The weather is the, the primary contributing factor to fire growth when we see fires that, that trigger evacuations, when we see the fires that burn entire communities. Understanding what weather can trigger wildfires, can trigger to especially the catastrophic wildfires is so important. So uh, we, we should all now, living in California, understand the basics of the term a red flag warning. This is a, a weather warning that's issued by the National Weather Service. It's not FireSafe Marin or your local FireSafe Council or your fire department that determines when a red flag warning is to be issued. It's not something that's there uh, to scare you. It's got nothing to do with politics. This is uh, determined by meteorologists looking at, at predicted weather conditions and what they're actually observing. Uh, red flag warnings are sometimes preceded by what's called a fire weather watch. That's when the weather, the meteorologists think that, that a red flag warning is likely. Um, a red flag warning is issued when they're actually observing the conditions that would trigger explosive fire growth typically. Usually for us, that centers around winds, strong dry winds coming from the northeast or east in Northern California and the Bay Area, coming from the east in Southern California. We call those Diablo winds here in Northern California. Southern California calls them the Santa Anas and the Rocky Mountains. You might refer to them as Chinooks or uh, they have local names typically. We've recently learned, you know, maybe met much of the country might understand this, but the Bay Area doesn't see a lot of lightning during the fire season. Uh, when lightning is predicted or observed, when it's actually occurring, it can trigger a red flag warning, and that did happen recently. Slightly different than a red flag warning issued for winds. It's got to do with the number of fires that might ignite, uh, less than the, the speed that a fire might spread or how fast it might develop. So important to understand that, and it's important to monitor those weather conditions. Again, this is just an illustration of the, the history of wildfires and winds related to those red flag warnings. When we see Diablo winds coming from the northeast in Marin County, we, we know it's trouble. Um, our history of wildfires in Marin County, catastrophic major wildfires, uh, have typically centered around these northeast wind events, but not always. We have a major fire burning in Marin right now. Uh, that, that is not related to the winds at all. It was related to being ignited by lightning in a remote location. Something to be aware of, and if you live in uh, just about any community in Northern California, looking to the Northeast, you can, you can uh, pretty much bet that that's the direction that the fire is going to come from when catastrophe strikes. 
being set also just has to do with your situational awareness and understanding of what's happening around you. You, know, you, can, you can be set and understand your situation by watching the TV news, listening to news radio, uh, reading the newspaper, uh, using your senses. We can't overlook this. Just look, listen, smell. Do you smell smoke? Do you hear sirens? Lots of information available to you. Uh, well, nobody's going to spoon feed this to you. You're going to have to gather information from a variety of reliable sources. Learn what those are. <sighs> Situational awareness needs to be uh, heightened when a fire is burning nearby. This, this you know, uh, it goes without saying on a day like today when uh, the entire region is, is blanketed in smoke. But oftentimes our fires are small fires that the fire department is eminently able to control. They might be burning in or around your neighborhood. They might be less obvious, but those are still times you need to be aware. You need to start your preparations. Think about what might happen. Prepare your family, your pets, and your home. We're going to talk about how you do that in a second. Situational awareness also has to do with how you get your alerts and warnings. You need to take steps in advance, like now, today, if you haven't already to uh, ensure that you're going to receive the electronic warnings that we send out. In Marin, we use Alert Marin, we use Nixle, we have uh, uh, options to send out things like the wireless emergency alerts, similar to the presidential alerts that ring every cell phone in a region. Uh, we use NOAA weather radios. I'll cover those in a little more detail in an upcoming slide. But you've got to be registered for and you've got to understand how you might receive alerts when a fire's threatening your community. Alert Marin, I mentioned, this is our primary emergency notification system in Marin County. Virtually every uh, uh, county in Northern California has a similar system. I bet you most counties nationwide have some type of emergency alerting system. I say this because I know there are a lot of people viewing this who aren't from Marin. This is Marin County. If you live uh, uh, south of Sonoma County and north of San Francisco, this is how you will receive your emergency notifications when an evacuation for a wildfire is necessary. This is the best tool we've got. It works well. It has a, uh, a few uh, slight limitations that I'll talk about, um, but, but this is something that you've got to be aware of and you need to pre-register for it if you haven't already. Alert Marin needs to know your address and it needs to know how to contact you. The three primary systems I mentioned, I'm gonna really quickly uh, uh, breeze through this, but Alert Marin, that's the primary system. Nixle is a service that's available to any government agency to send out informational notices. We'll oftentimes repeat messages that went out via Alert Marin on Nixle, but we can't target specific street addresses with Nixle. Nixle will send out notifications to an entire zip code, and that's not always the best choice for sending out evacuation notices, especially when the uh, firefighters want to stagger evacuations or target specific streets and neighborhoods to evacuate them in the order that makes the most sense related to what the fire's doing. So Nixle, a little, little more broad reach. Because of that, we use it for informational notices that should go out to the entire community rather than targeted messages. Social media, commonly used. It's a great source of information. Your fire department, sheriff's office is probably using social media like Twitter, Facebook, and Nextdoor to get information out. This is going to be lower level information. Again, it might repeat evacuation information that's already been uh, distributed elsewhere, but this is where you're going to get sort of the, the you know, the, the, the basic information about road closures and, and uh, uh, possibly evacuation centers and resources that might be available to you as an evacuee or someone who's living in a fire zone. <sighs> when we use these notification systems, the terminology that's distributed is really important. You've got to understand what the, what the message you receive means. Uh, there will be some helpful information, some guiding language when you receive the notices, but you've, you've still got to look at this and think about it in advance. So, so hearing this tonight, I think will help some of you. An evacuation order. This is the most important message you might receive. This means that you need to evacuate immediately. You're not going to delay to gather your belongings. You're not going to delay to prepare your home. You're going to take care of your personal safety. Doesn't mean you just run out the door. I'm going to show you a couple things you need to do in advance of an evacuation order or when you receive it. <clears throat> but you're not going to take the time to gather up a bunch of belongings and load your car. You've got to go when you receive the order. An evacuation warning 
is uh, uh, the next level down, this is a notification that says that you do have some time to prepare. You've certainly got time to prepare yourself, your family, your pets. You also probably have some time to prepare your home, things that you can do outside of the home that we'll talk about a little bit later. And, uh, and, and uh, you gather those belongings, gather grandma's photo albums and, and uh, uh, you know, the things that are important to you, your electronic information, that sort of thing. Load your car and be prepared for evacuation. We in Marin County only use the evacuation warning if you have, if you have in, in the belief of the firefighters who are directing the fire, at least two hours to evacuate. Uh, oftentimes it's much more. In this, uh, the case of the Woodward fire that's burning in Marin right now, uh, some of the evacuation warnings have been in effect for almost a week. Um, uh, uh, lots of time to prepare and get yourself ready. Shelter in place is another, uh, I, I don't wanna say it's a lower level message because it can mean a couple of different things. It means you need to stay secured in your current location. That might be because the, the, we understand in the fire service that, that evacuation could be more dangerous than leaving your home. Oftentimes it simply means that we think that it would be best if you didn't evacuate and you allowed the fire service, firefighters to come in and fight the fire. Uh, stay in your home, stay secured, go through our checklists that we're gonna talk a lot about and uh, make sure that you stay safe indoors. Here's this checklist. This checklist is uh, available at firesafemarin.org. Uh, on our evacuation page, we distribute it by paper. We're distributing it in West Marin communities as we speak. Uh, it's downloadable in a PDF format. Uh, you really ought to have one. I'd love for everyone who's watching tonight to review this. And although it has some Marin specific information, overall, uh, th this would be useful to just about anybody who lives in California. It's divided into three columns. The first column are things that you always do when there's a wildfire burning nearby or there's an evacuation warning or order. The second column are things that you'll only do if you have time. So really things that you'll do if there's an evacuation warning or if you, you're simply concerned because it's a, maybe a red flag warning has been issued or we're deep into fire season. And the third column are things that you'll do when you're actually evacuating, when you're on the road, once you've left. <clears throat> We're gonna take a, a real, real quick break here. Um, uh, maybe take the first uh, set of questions. I think Rich might have a couple questions for us. Um, and then we're gonna move into the next section. Rich, any questions coming Great. in? Well, thank you, Todd. Just uh, bringing up some of the questions people are asking about. One issue is if you have no cell coverage or the power is out, how are you gonna receive the alerts? So it takes a little bit of pre-planning, preparedness in advance to receive messages when, uh, when the power's out. Uh, there are potentially options, uh, especially for short-term power outages like battery backups, uninterruptible power supplies that can power your home internet, your home phone. Uh, your, a cell phone is a great choice. Some of us don't have good cell reception and in some cases, especially during longer-term power outages, the cell towers might fail. We saw that happen last year. So uh, what we recommend, uh, two fantastic options, a battery powered AM FM radio tuned to your local news radio stations. We have great relationships with all of the news radio stations in the Bay Area. You will get good information quickly via an AM FM radio. On our evacuation checklist, we list the stations that we think you ought to be listening to. There might be others. Another good option are NOAA, uh, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration uh, weather radios. We, uh, they're used commonly to, for tornado warnings and other severe weather event warnings. Uh, in Marin County, we have the ability to send out uh, notifications related to wildfire evacuations over the NOAA weather radios. Um, a, a, a great option, they actually can sound uh, an alarm and flash lights and can wake you up in the middle of the night, even when your cell phone might not, uh, during a power outage. They work on batteries, really good option, and you can get them for about $20. Thanks, Todd. Another question, are fire roads ever safe or temporary evacuation to open space areas? We hate to say never, but, but this is one of the places where I'm willing to say never. I've actually got a slide about this coming up in a few minutes, but fire roads are not a good option. The fire roads in Marin all lead to places that are less safe than uh, just about any paved road. 
Um, I, again, I hate to say never, but they should never be your first choice for evacuation. What we tell people is that in the very limited cases where a fire road might be appropriate for evacuation, you will be directed to go there by law enforcement or the, a firefighter. So no, not safe. Um, I live in a community that only that has a road, only one road in and out. So how am I supposed to evacuate? I, I, I love this question uh, and we get it all the time. Um, if you've got one way in and one way out of your community, you've already answered your question. That's your way out. Uh, uh, and it, it, I'm going to talk a lot about this and show some videos in a minute that will help you understand why your one way in and one way out is probably not as devastating or deadly as you might have thought. Uh, we understand that that's scary, and I wish you had multiple ways out of your neighborhood, but many do not. Um, that's your way out. That's a trigger that you ought to be working with your community to make sure that your road is as well maintained and as best protected as possible. Um, another one is there's a lot of busy main roads like Sir Francis Drake Boulevard, and they're jammed every single day. Isn't it just going to be a nightmare? I'm going to be stuck there if I have to evacuate? Yeah, well, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to transition into the next part of the, the, uh, the presentation here because we're going to cover these topics in details. But no, Sir Francis Drake Boulevard, Novato Boulevard, Highway 1 and 101 in Marin, uh, uh, they are not deadly. These are the places we want you to congregate. And I'm here to tell you that being stuck in traffic on Sir Francis Drake Boulevard is one of the safest places you can be during a devastating wildfire. It's on the valley floor. I'm going to explain why it's such a safe place to be. As much as the traffic may be, uh, it, you know, may cause a lot of anxiety for you, it's not going to kill you. And our goal is survival. So one last question. Um, what is the best source of information about a current fire in Marin County? <sighs> For wildfires, the best sources of information are going to be Marin County Fire Department via their wildfire information hotline or via their uh, social media outlets um, uh, or the Marin County Sheriff's Office. Those are the two agencies that are most likely to be involved in fighting a wildfire and in involved in evacuations. Um, Alert Marin, uh, again, is really the best source of the information that you need for survival. So Marin County Fire Department, Marin County Sheriff's Office, or your local fire department, your local law enforcement agency. Thanks, Todd. All right, so let's move on here. Then we're going to talk about evacuation survival. We're going to rehash a lot of the, uh, the stuff I just talked about, but in greater detail and show you some slides and, and uh, videos. But first I want to make an introduction. <sighs> this is a, a personal friend of mine. Uh, she's a, a world-class athlete, a professor, and a survivor of the campfire. Uh, she evacuated and survived the, the deadliest and most destructive wildfire in California history, uh, Dr. Shanamar Dewey. Hi, everybody. Uh, my 10 minutes starts now, Todd? I'm starting now. All righty. Uh, welcome to the, the Living with Wildfire Forum, everybody. Normally, I would say thank you for having me, but I think you should take a second and thank yourselves for being here today. Um, I'm trying to talk and get my presentation going at the same time, which I'm not qualified to do, but we're doing it. Here we go. One second. We did practice this. <laughs> Have to do it like this. All right, are we in business? You're in business. All right, so I have now nine minutes and 10 seconds to tell you about the scariest three and a half hours of my life. And I am, I have a doctoral degree in physiology. I know a few things about neurons in the brain and I will add that little flavor to my story here because you've heard probably, probably seen at least one, if not three, all three of the great productions that are out there that tell various stories of the campfire. Um, when my family watches those, they say, wait, is that what you went through? And I say, yeah, it is in some ways what, what I went through. 
Um, so I'm going to just give you a very quick tour. And the purpose of this is not to for me to relive it because I certainly don't need to do that. It's my hope is that by sharing my story, I can help some of you feel a little more prepared. And as I'll talk about to help your brains be more prepared, which your brain is different than you. We can talk about that later if you want. Um, so the night before the campfire, California had been in seven years of drought. You guys were very familiar with the Tubbs fire. The car fire in Redding had happened in July. Very high winds. We were getting warnings from PG&E that because of high winds, our power might be shut out. And I actually ended up having nightmares all night that there was fire around me. And I remember waking up thinking, if there's a fire anywhere in the vicinity, I'm out of here. I'm not waiting. And I don't think it was unique or or fortuitous that I'd had those dreams. It just was a coincidence because of all these other triggers that set that off in my neurons. But why I bring it up is because I woke up at 7 a.m. and I did, I checked the Cal Fire Twitter feed. The only reason I joined Twitter was actually to follow <laughs> Cal Fire and because of fires. And sure enough, there was this fire there and you can see it, that little yellow blip in, in the right there. And that green house in paradise on the map is where, where we were located. That's where I was living at the time. So I wanted to show you this and, and then tell you that I, I saw that feed. The fire had started at, the post was at 6.51 a.m. I'm a logical, educated person and I thought to myself, wait, I said I was going to leave. If there was a fire anywhere near me, it's very windy. Let's get out of here. And so I like to introduce this slide right here. And if we were in a crowd, I would have you tell your neighbor what you see for each of those situations, A, B, and C. And so maybe you can do that with somebody you're at a watch party with or um, your neighbor or your dog, or if you have a, a dinosaur. I have a dinosaur. The cameras are so weird. I have a dinosaur. I would tell my dinosaur. Maybe you don't have a dinosaur. Uh, what do you see in each of these three cases? And I'll just pick on C because it's one of my favorites. You're probably either saying a duck or a rabbit, and, right? A duck or a rabbit, yeah. So and the point is that our brain is trained to either see what we wanna see, what we're afraid to see, or, or what we think we see, what we're used to seeing. And that's called the failability of perception. And so when I looked at that fire, I said, well, we kayak up in the Feather River Canyon. That's a 40 minute drive. Maybe I know it's around the corner. Maybe it's more like 10 miles. We've mapped it since then. It's 7.8 miles away. But my experience with fire is if it's 10 miles away, you have some time to think about it. And so that's what we did. And my husband and I thought about it. We don't leave. Uh, 41 minutes later, we go outside and you can see this cloud and you're probably all thinking that looks like a fire cloud. <laughs> But I'm thinking, no, that looks like a cloud. It's a beautiful sunrise. Look, my husband just finished painting our house last night. Isn't it great? 8 a.m., well, this sunrise is really lasting. Now I know that that was orange created by flames that were not more than just about a mile from my house at the time. I did check to see if I was evacuated. Um, we saw some embers falling. I said, I'm not leaving the house till we pack a few things. Um, we weren't officially evacuated until another hour later. So by the time we were officially evacuated, we were packed and ready to go. And then I said, and, and somewhere in the middle there around 830, uh, it went from like this, this glowy to like really dark, like it's 830 in the morning and I need, um, I need the lights on in the house to, to try to figure out what I'm going to bring with me. So we, we packed for about 30 minutes. And then at one point I said, this is stupid. We need to go. And we finally checked. I didn't realize I should have been following the Butte County Sheriff Twitter feed to see that we were evacuated. So our official evacuation order came in at 841. Remember, initially I was ready to leave at 7 a.m. Then we decided to pack starting around 8. Somewhere in the middle of packing, we're like, wait, this is getting crazy. We should probably leave. We still didn't leave. We still had to look at that evacuation order from the county sheriff. Uh, I think my husband first found it on our town Facebook page. And, and I know none of you are going to make this mistake because you're all here today and, you've, and you're learning from all of these great professionals and experienced people that are giving you very solid advice. So I'm just telling this story to kind of help re-show this availability of perception and how your brain wants to grab on what it thinks or what it knows to be true. We started hearing thunder at this point. And those were actually propane tanks exploding. But my brain said, oh, that's weird. There's a storm going on. Maybe the fire is creating a local storm. Um, 
we went to talk to our neighbors. We were ready to go and I said our, our neighbors were elderly. We had to check in on them first. So neighbor Joe is standing in his front yard. It's, it's dark out. Embers are falling. We can smell the smoke at this point. And he says, they will never let the fire get past Pence. Now at this point, we still imagine this fire was 10 miles to the northeast of us. Um, and you can see here where Pence Road is and how the fire, that little block of yellow is officially confirmed fire. Now the maps you're seeing with the color behind this presentation are from a fire progression heat map that was published obviously many days after the fire. And actually, if anything, they're conservative estimates. You'll see when we left our driveway, our first flames were actually just a block and a half away from our house. So I can't go through the whole three and a half hours. Um, our strategy with the fire was, it was north and east, so we would head south and west. The campfire was very unique, you guys. It had a lot of wind. Most fires won't, won't go this way. Um, but that wind picked the fire up and as you know, it dropped it on top of town. So we were going away from the fire. Um, I'll admit that my gas tank was very low. I had an almost empty gas tank when we started the evacuation. We decided to take back roads because we thought they wouldn't be crowded because Google Maps said there wasn't any traffic. And of course we hit traffic right away. So we spent, uh, we went down this line here, you can see going south, again, trying to go south and east, but you can see that arrow on the far left side of the screen pointing to flames already over by Honey Run Road in the canyon there where the fire had just basically dropped on top of town over there. Um, we got stuck on the, the small road behind our house and had to do a U-turn. Uh, keeping in mind, I didn't know there was all that fire, but all those little flames you're seeing are actual spots of flames that we saw during our evacuation. And I was really grateful for the one piece of advice in my head this whole time during the evacuation as I'm turning my car off and on to try to like eke out the little bit of gas in the gas tank uh, was that Todd Lando had told us if you're ever in a fire stay in your car and so we saw some people getting out and running and it just was never a question in my mind Todd says stay in the car stay in the car uh, we continued to go away from the fire and at this point we started realizing it was around us we're seeing flames as we go we we drove past flames we were fine and um, we continued to head south and east out of town. You can see as we approach Neal Road here, that ended up being one of the, the best of the four routes out of town. Even though you see that top really red spot in the top left corner, there's people in there and they all survived. They're in their cars, there's flames all around them. They were in traffic, but they stayed on Skyway and they got out of town just fine. The same thing happened for us. So we're driving down Neal Road here. We were stopped at this one spot for 45 minutes, just watching the flames creep closer to us. People were out of their cars at this point, stepping on embers. At one point, a group got a garden hose from a house three houses away and brought it closer so they could spray any flames that got near us. Um, it was kind of an interesting community event where we all just were helping each other. It was surprisingly, we saw a lot of great sides in humanity. Saw some people picking up other people, cars breaking down, people helping push them out of the way and other people jumping in. Um, a lot of really great, um, examples of how good humanity can be. Uh, so around 124, we'd said we're officially safe. Um, and that this was the view that we saw when we were safe. Uh, and just, I know I'm flying through this because I'm really trying to stay on schedule. My takeaways that I wanted to leave you all with are that your perception's failable. Your, your brain categorizes based on what it knows. Uh, you can prepare your brain by thinking ahead. Even just listening to my talk right now may actually help you make a good decision um, later on down the road. Hopefully that never happens and you aren't in the same shoes I was in. First responders are amazing, but they are human. Keep your brain on. Leave early if it looks like you should leave, but also know your local roads and don't expect to know the right way. There's never going to be a right way or a wrong way. You'll just have to make a decision. In general, heading towards big roads is a, is a good way to go. Um, stay in your car and every fire is different. So I really don't think the campfire will be repeated. The conditions were incredibly perfect for the firestorm that happened and the late morning and how close it was to town. I don't think we should live in a constant state of fear. And I know I'm saying that as you're surrounded by fires, but I think that if we think ahead and we're ready, we'll we'll all be safe and we might lose some possessions and that is really hard. And I'm, I feel all ready for the people that have lost their houses in this year, but um, hopefully that won't happen to you. And hopefully this talk has helped you prepare. Thank you.
Sean Amar, thank you. Okay, can't thank you enough for that. I, 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 part of me feels like we could just end this here and and uh, go to the Q and A. Uh, uh, really fantastic story. I'm just gonna I'm gonna transition here, but I want to say that that uh, um, when right about the time that Sean Amar took the the photograph uh, where she's surrounded by fire, I called her on her cell phone. And uh, she picked up the phone. She sounded as calm as can be. And I said, Shanamar, how are you? And she said, I'm fine. How are you and the kids? I said, I heard you're near a fire. And she said, well, I'm surrounded by fire. So her first question was how I was doing and how my kids were <laughs> while she was surrounded by fire. If we could all keep ourselves together like that in a moment of crisis, uh, well, we'd probably all survive. Let me get back to sharing my screen here. <clears throat> we talked a little bit about things that you need to do to prepare in advance. Shaunamar described some of the things that, that she felt that she should have done the night before but didn't. I, I would like everybody who's watching this, if you don't have one already, to go home, uh, put together a wildfire and emergency go kit. If you live in California, you need to have a kit that prepares you for earthquakes. You probably need to have one that uh, prepares you for floods. If you live near hillsides, you probably need to prepare for mudslides. Um, oh, we need to be prepared for emergencies because we live here in a place that's just constantly confronted by emergencies. Wildfire go kits have some special needs. Uh, our evacuation checklist at FireSafe Marin goes through all of the contents, but I'll real quickly run through what I think are critical in your wildfire go kit. Flashlights. <laughs> The photographs Sean Amar showed uh, of her evacuation were midday, mid late morning. They were dark as night. Doesn't matter what time you evacuate, you are going to need a flashlight. And every firefighter I know carries multiple flashlights, one in every pocket with backup spare batteries. So have a headlamp, have multiple handheld flashlights and have spare batteries in your go kit. One of the most important things you can have. Make sure that you've got an AM FM radio. Uh, our checklist goes through items like uh, uh, spending cash, maybe a, a, a duplicate credit card, important documents, copies of your passports, your insurance uh, information, a small first aid kit, drinking water. Uh, uh, you know, you, you don't need three days of drinking water and I don't want you to uh, carry three days of drinking water like you, you might have in your uh, earthquake survival kit. In your wildfire go kit, you need to have enough drinking water to get you out of town. You need to have some high energy food. You need to have uh, some basic tools. We're gonna to talk a little bit about emergency clothing and what you should wear. And that's something that should be with your go kit or inside your go kit ready to go at all time. Store this in a backpack. We want you to be able to put this on your back and uh, move on foot, even though we're gonna talk a lot about evacuating by car and why that should be your first choice it still needs to be portable and something that you can take with you if you do need to leave your car in that, that outlier scenario. Keep these in your car if you're always with your car or near your front door during fire season. Make a kit for every member of your family, especially for your kids. Make a kit that uh, might be a little different than yours for your pets. We want you to dress for survival. So these are things, these clothing items, these are things that you might not be able to find in the middle of fire season, in the middle of summer. Keep a spare set of clothing that looks like this with your go kit, a spare set for everybody. And the, every item shown here, and the, this, this is, uh, the, this picture is actually out of Australia. They look, maybe look a little goofy to us, um, but I want you to look goofy while you're evacuating. Long cotton or wool clothing, long pants, long shirt. Cotton or wool is important. It won't, uh, it, it won't melt from embers. It won't melt from radiant heat. It provides a huge amount of protection to you. It's almost as good as the clothing that firefighters wear. Um, uh, it, it really does provide a lot of protection. Long cotton or wool pants, heavy boots, leather boots. I, I can't tell you how many photographs I've seen of people evacuating in their nightgowns and flip-flops if they even have shoes. This can save your life heavy shoes that will let you run over broken glass that will let you run over hot embers. That floppy cotton hat they're wearing is important. It's not there for, uh, for looks, obviously. It's there to prevent embers from landing in your hair. We've seen some people put a, 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 like a construction worker's hard hat in their, uh, in their emergency go kit. That's just fine too. 
This is to protect your head from embers, specifically the hat. Every one of us, uh, I, I guess I don't need to put the N95 mask or the face shield. We all have those with us all the time now, um, but hopefully when COVID-19 is over, we all keep those with us, put them in our go kits and have them ready to go. Carry spares. That, that person's wearing an N95 mask underneath the cotton bandana. The mask provides some protection from particulates, the, uh, the particles that are in the smoke, the cotton bandana provides protection to the skin on their face from radiant heat from the flames if they get too close. The two pieces of life-saving equipment in this picture that you need to have in your go kit are the goggles and the leather gloves. I, uh, I, I, let me tell you why. <clears throat> the number one injury for wildland firefighters are eye injuries. A wildland firefighter out of, you know, big tough firefighter working on a wildfire gets a speck of dust or an ember in their eye and they're out of service. They can no longer fight the fire. They've got to go to the hospital to have it uh, washed out of their eyes. If that happens to you while you're evacuating, it could cost you your life. If you're not able to walk or drive yourself out of your neighborhood because you've got a speck of dust in your eyes, you'll really regret not having listened to us when we said get a full coverage ceiling pair of goggles with the uh, anti-fog treatment, if you wear eyeglasses, make sure you get the pair that's designed to fit over your glasses. Check them, check them regularly. Make sure that the strap hasn't degraded and that they aren't scratched. Keep a clean set of goggles in your go kit. Those gloves, equally life-saving. Everybody here, I, I know everyone watching is worried about being caught behind some kind of obstruction in the roadway. When, and this happens, it, it does happen. It happened in the campfire. It's happened in probably all of the fires in the Bay Area that are burning right now. If debris falls into the roadway during a wildfire and blocks your passage, it fell there because it was on fire. You very well may be able to move that debris out of the road as long as you have protection for your hands. Those gloves are life savings because they'll let you pick up hot objects and move them out of your way. Um, I, I, I can't emphasize this enough. Heavy leather gardening gloves is all you need. Um, you don't need any special firefighting gloves, just a heavy pair of leather gloves and keep them on while you're evacuating. It looks goofy, but it can save your life. We want you to think about your pets. Um, this isn't just because they're adorable and we love our pets. It's because people love their pets so much that they're willing to die for them over and over again. We've seen dozens, if not now, hundreds of people in California die during wildfires because they could not find or could not catch their pets when the fire was approaching. We recommend keeping this uh, a carrier. In fact, this one in particular, I, I think is great. Uh, uh, the picture's from amazon.com, right? This, is, this uh, carrier is portable, it's soft. You can keep it by your front door. It has a little annex where you can put food and water and I'm here to tell you when you're worried, when you receive the evacuation warning or you just smell smoke in your neighborhood, catch your cat, put them in this carrier. They're not gonna like it. They're not gonna be happy about it, but they're gonna be safe because you will not be able to catch your cat or find it. It will be so deep under your couch when your anxiety is high and the embers start falling in your neighborhood. And Shauna Moore didn't mention it, but she lost her cat. She hasn't seen her cat since the campfire. Um, I, you know, it, it's sad and it's tragic, and this is something that, that uh, we need to think about. We need to understand what we'd be willing to do for our animals and, and take steps long in advance to make sure that we can get them out safely. Keep uh, that food and water, if they have any medications or special needs, keep it with them. We're going to talk a little bit about some things you can do during an evacuation warning. I just uh, I threw this uh, slide in. This is the evacuation warning that's still in effect for uh, the community of Inverness Park, uh, Bolinas, um, uh, lots of areas of West Marin, just a few miles from where I'm sitting. Um, this was issued on August 18th. It's an evacuation warning that said a 700 acre fire is burning west of Olima. Gather your medications, pets, and critical papers. Be prepared to evacuate if necessary. Most of the people by affected, that were affected by this are still in the evacuation warning zone. They have not been ordered to evacuate yet. Again, a week later. So they've had lots of time to prepare. They've had an opportunity to do more than just gather their pets and critical papers. They've had time to prepare their house. This is important because if your house doesn't burn, uh, it, you could potentially be there safely. 
We're not suggesting that you don't evacuate, but we are suggesting that we need to keep houses from igniting and burning during wildfires. That checklist that we've been talking about, the second column are things that you can do to prepare your home inside and outside or around your neighborhood. We want you to follow the checklist. Uh, I'm going to give you a few of the highlights. We want you to, if time allows, back your car into your driveway. Make sure your car is ready to go. Make sure it's packed with the things that you need to take with you. Close the doors and windows in your house. Seal all those doors and windows. Make sure they're nice and tight. We want to keep embers from entering any space inside your house. We want you to turn on the lights in your house. We want firefighters to be able to see the house. It makes it easier for us to find it. It makes us easier to rescue you if, if that's needed. It makes it easier for firefighters to protect your home if the lights are on. Don't worry about energy consumption. If the power's on, just turn the lights on inside the house. We'd like you, if you have time, to seal your vents. I'm gonna show you a great picture of, uh, of what, what this looks like. We want you to seal the vents into the crawl space, into the attic spaces, any opening that could potentially allow embers into your house. We've got a lot of uh, information in our home hardening seminars online, what, uh, why vents are vulnerable, but those vents into your crawl space and attic are, are uh, commonly the entry point for embers that burn houses down. We want you to move combustibles away from the house. I'm talking about things like, uh, uh, combustible furniture outside the house. We want you to prop open gates. We want you to put hoses and buckets out, place ladders, shut off the gas and propane if you have time. This is a home. This photograph was taken uh, just two days ago in Inverness Park, community that's been uh, 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 in the evacuation warning and now parts of them are under an evacuation or order. This is an aluminized uh, duct tape that's being used to cover up the foundation or uh, crawl space vents that lead into this house. That They used vents that had openings that are too large by today's standards. They're, the openings in the vents are one quarter inch and would allow embers in and they've done a great job sealing this off to keep embers from getting in. This is a photograph that was taken today. Same neighborhood, same community. They are evacuated. This is a house that burned down during the Vision Fire in 1995. You can tell that when they rebuilt it, they really didn't want it to burn, and they're taking it seriously today. Their landscaping is immaculate. Their roof is completely clean. They have steel siding and a steel roof. Um, I, I have every reason to think that this house is going to be here after even the worst wildfire, but they've taken extra steps. They followed our checklist. They've got buckets of water. They've got garden hoses out. There are garbage cans full of water at every corner of the house. They are ready for war. <laughs> Here's one of their neighbors down the roads that they've moved a potted plant off of their front porch. They have placed buckets of water right by their front door. They placed a ladder to the roof. This is on our checklist. It's something that you can do to help firefighters more quickly access your roof if there are, uh, if embers have landed there and lit, uh, ignited uh, needles or leaves that might be on your roof. Here's one of their other neighbors that's propped their gate open with a rock. This is a wooden gate that's attached to a fence and to the house. Just by propping this gate open, they've created a fire break, a fuel break that won't allow a fire to spread from the fence to the house itself. Those are the things that you can do when you've received an evacuation warning and you have some time to prepare. I'll, I'm gonna talk in a, in a minute about some of the decision-making that goes behind that, but if you receive an evacuation order, the decision to leave has been made for you. It's time to go. You don't stop to prepare your house. You only prepare yourself by dressing appropriately. Put on the clothes that we talked about, head to toe. Get in your car with your family and your pets and whatever has already been placed in your car and leave immediately. This is the evacuation order that was issued by Alert Marin last night at 6.12 p.m. for parts of Inverness Park. Um, an evacuation order, it says, has been issued for the Woodward Fire for the following areas, Silver Hills Road, Fox Drive, Norin Way. <sighs> you need to evacuate immediately. It provides directions. Evacuate down Sir Francis Drake Boulevard toward Point Reyes. Be mindful of firefighting resources. Provides information on lodging and evacuation centers. This is typical and what you ought to expect in your own neighborhood if an evacuation order is given. Don't be this guy. This photograph's from 1991, the Oakland Hills fire. This house did not survive the Oakland fire. 
he's putting himself and firefighters at incredible risk uh, uh, by standing on a peaked, peaked roof, uh, then, then hosing the roof down to make sure it's slippery. Um, I, as far as I know, he didn't fall off the roof, but had he, he might not have survived. There wouldn't have been anybody to help him. Um, this is totally ineffective. It didn't work in this case, and it won't work in your case, but we see it every time there's a wildfire burning in California. Don't be this guy. That evacuation order, the decision to, make, uh, to leave uh, might be made for you if you receive an evacuation order, but it also might be a decision you need to make. If you have no communication, if you've lost uh, uh, you know, access to cellular and internet, you don't have a battery backup uh, uh, radio, you might need to decide to leave. So certainly leave when ordered, but leave if conditions worsen. If you aren't sure, go ahead and leave. If you feel unsafe, if embers are falling in your neighborhood, it's absolutely time to leave. You may have to make that decision on your own and be prepared to make that decision. I'm gonna to try to show you a short video here. This is an evacuation last year in Sonoma County. The kids have packed their go bags. They're ready to go. You can see the fire in the neighborhood. A neighbor comes to tell them that it's time to go. This kid, I want Sean Amar to see, he's got a dinosaur, but he drops it. Thankfully, he picks it up again and is ready to go. <sighs> we want you to stay in your car when you evacuate. This is the meat and potatoes of our discussion tonight. This is so important. Based on the feedback and the questions that we receive at FireSafe Marin that we receive in our local fire departments, well, we can't emphasize this enough. Your car provides a huge amount of protection to you. It provides safety and protection from smoke and radiant heat from embers, convective heat, that's the hot air that blows in front of and above a fire. Uh, it, it, incredibly uh, protective environment inside your car. You've got an air filter, a filtration system, air conditioning, headlights, a battery powered AM FM radio. You have everything you need to survive inside your car. And the fear is that people have seen this image. This, this photograph was taken on that Pence Road in Paradise that Shonamar told us about. People have seen these cars this uh, photograph was when it was published was usually accompanied by a headline that said 88 people died. It's terrifying. You see this photograph and you assume that people were inside those cars when they burned up. Nobody wants to be trapped in a car. It's a, a burning car. You know, it's, it's certainly a, a logical fear that we all have. There were no, no people inside these cars. These cars were abandoned. For the most part, they were pushed off of the road by fire department, Cal Fire bulldozers. Uh, to open the road to provide passage to evacuate a hospital. These cars were abandoned by people who panicked in traffic. Um, I, I can't blame them and I'm not second guessing them and I do know that some of the cars had caught fire from embers that blew underneath the cars. Cars that catch fires do, typically do not explode like you see in Hollywood. If your car does catch fire, that's an opportunity for you to pull it off the road, step out and get in somebody else's car. But it's an extremely unlikely scenario. These cars were pushed to the side of the road into vegetation that then burned and ignited the car, and that's what happened. During the campfire, 88 people died. 79 of the people who died died in or around their homes. They never even started to evacuate. This is not a criticism of them. I feel for them and their families, and many of those people were elderly or disabled and had no option to evacuate. That's a topic for another discussion. Um, but 79 people died in and around their homes. Turns out about eight or nine people died during the evacuation process. Five of them were in their cars on one intersection of an unpaved rural road mid slope with fire below them on a mountainside. We're going to talk about why that's terrible. I want you to watch this short video. Give it some thought.
These are conditions similar to what Shanamar experienced driving outside of driving out of paradise, same fire, same roads. This has got to be terrifying for the driver. We like this video because it's got a happy ending. The driver emerges to relative safety. Um, uh, blue skies, firefighting aircraft, it must have been a huge relief to see that. Um, we do like to point out that this might be the point in the video that this driver is most at risk. The reason being he is now surrounded by unburned vegetation. They're now in a place where the vegetation can catch fire around them. For most of the video, they were driving through areas where the vegetation had already burned. This, the, uh, the heat was already dissipating. The vegetation had been consumed. Um, I, 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 when I, we've got an audience and we talk about this, I always like to ask, at what point was this driver in the most danger? I actually think that this point right here, they're in the most danger. If they got, got out and got out of the car or if the car broke down right now, they're in tremendous danger because of the unburned vegetation. I think the second most dangerous part of the video is when they pass people over the line uh, into, uh, into the oncoming lane in blinding smoke conditions. I think the least dangerous part of the video was when there were flames on the side of the road in the beginning and the vegetation had already burned. Important to keep that in mind. This is another video short one, 20 seconds or so, but just take a look. This is a community uh, in uh, Northern Alberta, in Canada. It's been evacuated now twice in the last four years for wildfires. Tremendous heat and flames from a forest fire in timber off to the right. These are 100, 150 foot tall flames. The passengers in these cars are safe, they're protected. Nobody died during the evacuation of uh, the community of Fort McMurray. People who didn't evacuate did die in Fort McMurray, just like they did during the Tubbs fire in Santa Rosa, during the Camp fire in Paradise. So this brings up the question of evacuation routes. If, if you've taken our word for it, and we're happy to have discussion and answer questions about it at the end here, that you ought to evacuate by car, you do need to know the route you're taking. We get a lot of questions about what route, what's the safest place, what is my route during a wildfire evacuation. It is difficult, if not impossible, for us to tell you what route you're going to take during a wildfire evacuation before the actual fire starts. The fire can start just about anywhere. Uh, we've warned for several years now about the threat of a fire that starts in uh, the eastern part of Marin, Nevada, the Highway 101 corridor under an east wind condition. Um, uh, yet here we are today with a fire that started as far west as possible in Marin County and it's threatening uh, the nearby communities and in some ways threatening the entire county. Um, so uh, just about any scenario is possible, it just depends on where the ignition occurs. We want you to simplify this and think about your route this way. Take the fastest route to the valley floor. The fastest paved road that you can take in your car is your best option. There are some limited times where you may choose, uh, rightly, to go on foot, but they're very limited. There are a handful of locations in Marin, especially in Mill Valley, Corte Madera, uh, possibly in Fairfax, hillside communities that were built with stairs and paths. There are a, a handful of homes. This is not every home served by those uh, in those neighborhoods. There are a handful of homes that are immediately adjacent to a path and if you were to step out your door and see that the fire was approaching and the roads were blocked, which is really unlikely, but and the path was clear, we're saying that that might be an option for you. We still think your best option is to get into your car and drive away. It gives you some shelter. It gives you a place to be during the evacuation, which might last weeks or longer, it might be years if your house were, were to be consumed by the fire. So take the fastest route to the valley floor, preferentially in your car on a paved road. 
go on foot if there's only no uh, if there's no other option. You've absolutely got to avoid fire roads. We're going to talk about temporary refuge areas or community refuge areas in one second here. What you're looking at here, the map that I just showed you, and the map that you see here is a new series of evacuation maps that are being published in Marin communities as we speak. Novato and Fairfax were the first two communities to publish these maps. They're designed uh, uh, using FEMA's uh, 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 method similar to FEMA's Tsunami Clear maps uh, designed by a talented uh, uh, professor, and I, uh, Claudine Janikin, who might be with us tonight. I wish she could speak, but we just don't have time. These are designed to be easily readable under stress uh, by people who are evacuating. Novato and Fairfax are published. They're available at firesafemarin.org slash evacuation slash maps. They're available from the local fire agencies and local communities. And uh, virtually every community in Marin will have similar maps published by the end of this year. It's a, it's a, a, a fantastic process, a good product that we think will help people. But it doesn't solve or answer every question that we get in the community. And this is simple. Take the fastest route to the valley floor. You already know what that route is. It's the route that you already take, probably to get to the grocery store every day. There are no secret routes out of your community. You may live in a neighborhood that has many streets and options to leave your neighborhood, and we want you to learn what those are, and we want you to look at these maps if you're lucky enough. If you live in a neighborhood that's served by one way in and one way out, that is your evacuation route. We don't have any secrets here. There's no option out and heading out over the hills through the fire gate is not an option. It's not a safe one. It's probably a deadly one. The maps are published in a three-step process with a citywide or a, a zone map that helps you figure out which local area map or zone map uh, serves your neighborhood. There are links and QR codes that will allow you to download these maps onto your mobile devices or onto your desktop computer. You can print them. Some of the communities will print these and mail them uh, initially to residents in the neighborhoods. The maps are uh, designed to be printed front and back and they have an evacuation checklist written by FireSafe Marin, the same one I've been referring to all night, printed on the back. Fantastic source of information. Uh, AM FM radio stations are printed on here, evacuation safety tips, lots of good information for you while you're evacuating. Uh, we're, we're excited to see these published in every community and we think it's going to be a helpful tool for Marin residents. Again, I'm going to emphasize this again, fire roads. A lot of communities are served by fire roads. Fire roads are not fire evacuation roads. They are access roads to allow firefighters to fight our routine fires. In some cases, they provide access into your community. So the fire engines may come into your community via fire road to allow the residents to evacuate on the pavement without fear of running into fire engines coming into the community. Here are those stairs. These are the Dipsy stairs in, in uh, Mill Valley. Uh, you know, good representation. It might be an option for you for all the reasons I discussed. <clears throat> While you're evacuating, we talked about moving towards the valley floor. We want you to get off of the hillsides. If you live in one of Marin's many hillside communities, you need to get to the lowest place possible onto the widest paved road possible. We want you, while you're evacuating, to watch out for the inside turns in the road. This is a great photograph that shows what happens when the flames reach over the road where there's a drainage. Where there's a drainage, there's always an inside turn in the road. The outside turns in the road are safer. And this slide, if you can embed this into your mind, can be a lifesaver. If you have to stop on the road because there's fire ahead of you, this, these flames will only last for a few seconds. And if you have to stop, stop where there's an outside turn in the road. Allow the heat to pass over in front of you and then move forward when the flames subside. This is a life-saving uh, piece of knowledge for firefighters. They use it every day. They probably used it today in Marin and uh, San Mateo and Sonoma County. Uh, you can use that knowledge also. We want you to be aware of temporary refuge areas. These are places uh, like ball fields, big parking lots. Uh, it could be a, a, a building that's uh, particularly well-constructed, maybe a commercial building with steel siding or a metal roof. These are places where you could potentially take refuge 
uh, during a wildfire evacuation, if your evacuation route were impeded, if you had nowhere else to go, if the road was blocked, as unlikely as that is, these are places that you can stop. And frankly, thousands of people used temporary refuge areas like golf courses and ball fields and parking lots during the Tubbs fire, the North Bay fires in 2017, the Camp fire, the Thomas fire in Southern California. Uh, right now, 250,000 Northern California residents are evacuated. Some of them had to evacuate when the fire was close by. Uh, some of them had to take refuge in places like this and it can be a viable option. Uh, we want you to know that traffic is not deadly and being stuck in your car on the pavement, on the valley floor, on a wide two lane road is no different than being sheltered in a temporary refuge area like a golf course. If you're on the valley floor and you're in your car and you're on pavement, in all likelihood, you're going to survive. In the North Bay fires, in the camp fire, although nearly 150 people died, nobody died in their cars if they made it to the valley floor, stayed in their car and stayed on pavement. Take that one to the bank. It's really important information and uh, we need all of you to think about that and remember that. All right, Todd, I can't thank you enough. That was a great presentation. There'll be plenty of opportunity to ask uh, more questions of Todd. We have some we haven't got to yet, but I think right now, what I'd like to do is bring up some takeaways. What are some of the things that you can do right now to get better prepared? Obviously, Todd talked about signing up for Alert Marin. He talked about Nixle and, some, and similar uh, systems that are out there. Other counties may have different names for those warning systems, but you wanna be signed up for your local alert system. You must have an evacuation plan. Pre-planning is really the best way to be prepared to evacuate. What you really wanna do is be prepared. And when the evacuation order comes, you wanna be the first one out. To help you with all that, download our evacuation checklist on our website. We had several questions about that. It's not very difficult uh, to find, but uh, we will be posting the answer to that in writing uh, on our website on top of all this. You wanna prepare your go kit. Todd gave a lot of information about that. It's gonna be a little bit different for different people. Probably the very most important thing you can have in that is medicines. The hardest thing to replace if you have to evacuate is the medicines that you're gonna need. So you wanna be sure you have that. And then obviously there's a lot of options and worthwhile things that you should have as part of your kit. Battery powered AMF radio, can't go wrong with that. You can tune into local radio stations. It's another one of the many alerting methods that are out there. We've all heard the weekly emergency alert test go off on a well, in our case on a Thursday afternoon. <clears throat> and all of that is designed by tuning to the local news channels and all to keep up with the latest information. And the last thing I'm gonna bring up is all of you, the 500 people who have participated in this webinar and the many more that are out there on uh, Facebook and whatnot, for what you're hearing tonight, talk to your neighbors about this. Our next webinar is gonna talk about how communities organize, how neighbors help neighbors, and how that's really the key to safety. I'm gonna ask Shannamar a little bit more about that when we go into our next questioning part here, but there was a lot of neighbor helping neighborhood in uh, paradise, and that's what saved a lot of lives are out there. So with all that said, um, we will now bring everybody back onto the screen. Uh, we'll be around for another 20 or 30 minutes, depending on how many questions there are, and we'll go ahead and try to answer some of those. So um, I'll begin with a question for Todd. Um, I know you addressed this, but it has, keeps coming up and there's confusion about whether or not people need to turn off the gas that supplies their house before they evacuate. How important is that? It's not critically important. Uh, it, it certainly isn't going to hurt you. 
Uh, but the, shutting off the gas uh, is not going to pre necessarily prevent an explosion. Uh, shutting off the gas to a propane tank does not protect the propane tank. Uh, it, it won't hurt you if you've got time and you're preparing to leave. Absolutely do it. It's on our checklist. But I also don't want you to panic and turn back because you forgot to turn off the gas on your way out. Um, uh, it, you know, it, it, if, uh, if everything goes right, it's not going to make a lick of difference because your house will survive. You've created your defensible space. You've hardened your home. Shutting off the gas shouldn't make a big difference for you. It's just uh, not critical. Um, another question that comes up a lot is, should we lock the house or leave it unlocked? People are very concerned about the fact that we read that, unfortunately, there was some looting that has taken place in some of the evacuation zones. Uh, th there has been looting in the past. Uh, I, I had a discussion with a resident in an evacuation zone at the Woodward Fire today who was getting ready to leave and they asked the same question and I told them to lock their door. That contradicts something that's on our checklist. We usually in the past have said leave your door unlocked. There's a good reason for that. If the fire department needs to enter your house, sometimes they may need to search it just to make sure nobody's trapped there. If they need to enter your house, it's easier if the door's unlocked. If they have to break the door down, now there's gonna be a big opening that could potentially allow embers in. It's not ideal. I, the best scenario is that they can enter the unlocked door. That said, right now, uh, uh, resources are so spread so thin in Northern California, we don't have the kind of fire engines and law enforcement activity that you would normally expect to see when neighborhoods are evacuated. So I recommended to this person that they go ahead and leave the door unlocked. The fire department can get through an unlocked door or a locked door. That, that's their specialty. Um, I, it, so, so this is a question that has sort of a new answer and an evolving answer based on what's actually happening today in California. Thanks. Shanamar, what's the trick to staying calm in one of these evacuation situations? Hey, uh, thanks for the question. The trick to staying calm. There, I don't think there is a trick. I think you breathe and you do the best you, of course, is like the five minutes that people are walking into the house right now. Um, not staying calm doesn't help. So you do everything you can to just make the best case scenario be the best case scenario. And if, if you panic, that's fine too. Just remember to take a second to breathe and just try to think logically. And I think preparing yourself mentally as much as you can ahead of time. So you know, everybody who lives in California right now should be thinking, I might have to evacuate in so at some point and it might be under duress and I might be looking at flames when it happens. So put yourself mentally there so your brain has experienced it at least once. And then if it does, which hopefully it doesn't, but if it does happen, you'll be a little more calm when it, when it finally does. I hope, I hope that helps. Okay. I, well, I would of, just I would just add that that the person in that photograph going over the waterfall in the kayak was actually Shanamar, so she has an unfair advantage in this uh, area. <laughs> Very good. Um, kind of a follow up to that, Shanamar, is uh, a lot of people worry about well, how, how can I evacuate if I don't know where I'm supposed to evacuate to? Was that your biggest concern, or was it making a safe evacuation? Yeah, I think when we started our evacuation, we had this great idea of like, yeah, the fire's there, let's go away from it. And by the time we realized it was all around us, I, I was in my car, I was trying to call 911, I was calling my dad, my brother, I was like, does anybody have any information about where we should go? And I only got a few answers and, and not very many good ones, but it was clear that we needed to move and to leave. So it was just kind of like, you know what, ultimately there's really only a few ways out of this town and we'll just keep keep heading that way. I think if I was in the same situation again after actually speaking and, and um, listening to the Fire Safe Marin presentations as much as I have, uh, I think our evacuation would have happened sooner and a lot more smoothly and I would have been a lot more confident in the decisions we made. So I'm not giving my story as an example of what was great. I think we made a lot of mistakes, but um, I'm hoping you guys are learning from those mistakes. <laughs> great, thank you. So a little bit of pre-planning and thinking if I did need to evacuate, where would I go? There's some obvious answers on that. Um, I can just, one thing on that, Rich, was I, my husband and I do know maps very well. We pay attention to directions and routes. And, um, you know, we'd moved to the area recently and we took it upon ourselves to know all our different routes very quickly. And that was important and helpful, so. 
right. think in the Bay Area, you're used to trying to get around traffic any way you can, so you probably know a lot of your options. Um, another thing for you, Todd, is that quite a few questions about if you are evacuating the home, should you leave some kind of note or sign for the firefighter so they know that you've left? Absolutely. Great idea. Uh, it, it's on our evacuation checklist. We recommend that you tape a note to the inside the front window of the house with the names of everybody who's been evacuated, contact phone numbers, uh, uh, and uh, basic information about where you're going. That can be useful. If you're not comfortable putting it on the ins outside window of the house or inside so that it's readable from the outside, you, you can put it on your uh, refrigerator door. Um, we'll look there when we're searching a house. So here's a question. I think all three of us can respond to this. It's, does it make sense to do some fire drills where you kind of practice this and practice getting your go kit and practice having the family organized? Would that have helped? <laughs> I think so. Yeah, I think you can't go wrong with that. All right. Um, an another one that has come up quite a bit is uh, a lot of people understand that the alert messages can come over the cell phones, but there's some confusion about if I don't have my phone on or I have it on do not disturb or any of the multiple settings on, tele on cell phones, am I still going to get the message? Can that really override all the settings and get, uh, get to me? Uh, yeah, with most phones, there is a way to uh, override so that you'll receive an alert even when your phone is set to silent or uh, uh, do not disturb mode. Uh, it varies depending on the phone you have, whether you have an Apple uh, iOS device or an Android phone or one of the other ones. Uh, you'll have to do some research and make sure that you find the way. But here, here's the important tip. If you, once you've registered for Alert Marin, you can actually log into your Alert Marin account and send yourself a test message. And I've done that. Send myself a test message to make sure that my phone is operating and I can receive messages. So if you're going to bed at night on a night when an evacuation warning has been issued, uh, uh, and, and you're going to sleep at night, you can go ahead and send yourself a test message to make sure your system works. I strongly recommend that you have a backup to your backup. Again, like the flashlights in your pocket, make sure that you've got an AM FM radio. Keep uh, sleep with the, the radio going. So if you wake up, you'd be surprised what your brain can do. It'll wake you up if it hears the, the keywords. Uh, so so uh, make sure you've got backup communication methods. Make sure your neighbors know where you are. Uh, and, uh, you know, really think about redundancy because things tend to fail. The power may go out while you're asleep and you may not be able to count on your normal communication methods to wake you up. Thanks. Um, you talk about shelter in place, kind of a last resort, but that can happen. Should you go to the basement or how does all that work? We have, uh, again, on our, our checklist, we have some instructions about what to do if you shelter in place. We'd like you to have all of your, your kit, your uh, go kit ready to go. Um, we'd like you to shelter inside your house on the main floor of the house or the easiest uh, floor that allows you to exit the house to a safe location. Uh, there may be, may be times where you need to take refuge inside your house or you're sheltering in place and the fire reaches your neighborhood. If that happens, we'd like you to stay near the front door, near the door that the fire department is most likely to come to. Uh, if your house were to catch fire, we want you to lay down on the floor by your front door and wait until there is smoke or heat inside your house. At that moment, when, the, when you can see smoke or heat inside the house, that's the moment you should step outside. With any luck, uh, the area outside of the house will already have seen the flame front pass by and you'll have, uh, it, it, you know, I'm not saying that this isn't going to be frightening, but you will have relatively safe conditions outside of the house. This is common. Firefighters take shelter inside homes all the time. It can be a, a relatively safe place for you to shelter. A uh, little different than the shelter in place discussion. We definitely don't want you going into the basement or into the attic or any place where it'll be difficult for you to get out or difficult for someone to find you if we have to rescue you. Um, there's some confusion about the definition of an inside versus outside turn. And what does that mean relative to evacuating for fires? Yeah, you know, imagine any place when you're driving on a, on a mountain road where you make a turn and there's a drainage below you. A dra it, it, and it doesn't necessarily need to be a steep drainage. It can be simply be a, sh a shallow turn in the road. 
It's a curve in the road where the terrain, the topography, allows heat to be channeled to the road. Uh, firefighters to learn, learn to look for very subtle uh, clues that tell us that we're in a drainage. Um, uh, uh, any kind of topographic feature that can provide what we call a chimney that channels heat up the slope is potentially deadly. So an outside turn would be what we would describe as maybe a shoulder on a hillside. An inside turn would be the drainage. Um, I, I, and again, can be more subtle than that. It doesn't need to be a, a really obvious inside turn to be potentially dangerous. If you um, are in a situation where shelter in place is your only option and you have a swimming pool, is it better to go in the swimming pool or to do what you described about staying in the house? <sighs> you know, this is tough. Again, th these situations can be really dynamic. I will say it, during the Tubbs fire in Santa Rosa, uh, uh, somebody did die in their swimming pools. <laughs> and and uh, I, so it's, it's not a, a guarantee. Your swimming pool might be a safe place for you to take shelter, but your airway is not protected. You still need to breathe the air outside and that, that's what uh, is the greatest risk to you. I think in many cases, your airway may be better protected inside the house, as frightening as that may be. Take the steps I said, stay near the front door and let yourself out of the house as soon as you see smoke or heat inside the house. Um, right now we have a fire which is burning along the coast. And some of the communities out there, their evacuation routes tend to go inland over Mount Tam or in some of those areas. Um, are they better off evacuating over those routes or going to the beach? Well, uh, to some extent, it depends on what the fire is doing. Uh, you know, uh, as evacuation warnings expand, uh, driving over the mountain is safe as long as you can see and understand that there's no fire on the mountain. Um, if there were a fire that were spreading to the hillsides, the slopes, it doesn't have to be at Mount Tam in this scenario, it could be anywhere. You, we don't want you to travel uphill. So there are routes, Highway 1 is a good example, um, where you can take the, essentially the low road and stay as low as possible, as close to the coast or as close to the valley floor for as long as possible. We usually want you to choose the direction that leads you away from the fire. Again, if your only option is uh, if you're at the top of the hill, your house is at the top of the hill and the fire is below you, you very well may need to drive downhill towards the fire. Um, and uh, if you live in a community where the only way out of your community is to go uphill for a short distance, you may have to make that decision and, uh, and understand that you're, you are violating one of our cardinal rules, so it's, uh, it's a dangerous situation to be in. We're, uh, we can't make uh, wildfire evacuation an entirely safe endeavor. It's dangerous. Uh, you talked about these evacuation maps being available. Are communities going to be told they're available or are people going to receive them in the mail? Communities will be told a variety of methods. The, the maps uh, that you see online are, are just becoming available for the first time. Um, the town of Fairfax will specifically be mailing copies of these in the coming weeks. Um, uh, the, the other communities will announce them via social media, via town newsletters, through FireSafe Marin's newsletter and other sources. Uh, the, it, they are intended to primarily be an online resource, an electronic resource, but we know not everybody has access, so they can still be printed. Uh, we would like to see people download the latest version of the maps. They may need to be updated relatively frequently as things change or we learn new things or roads change or information changes. So downloading the electronic version is the best way, way to go. Um. Do you think you can give us a little bit of an update on what the current fire status is in Marin right now? There's a lot of concerns. Are people living in San Geronimo Valley safe? Or is it overly smoky? Just what's the overall situation? How's it look to you? Yeah, in a general sense, I'm not gonna give any information uh, specific to the Woodward fire. That, that information is available from Marin County Fire and from the uh, Fire's Incident Command Team at the Point Reyes National Seashore. Uh, if you live in West Marin, look, look up information specific to that fire for the most current info. In general, there is one large fire burning in Marin County right now. Uh, your fire departments all still have firefighters. Uh, we do have a, a very large number of firefighters and resources out 
fighting fires actively across the state or a lot of them fighting a fire in Marin right now, but all of your local fire stations are still covered. There are still fire engines and people there. So you should still call 911 and expect a fire engine to arrive if there's a new fire in your neighborhood. In general, the uh, communities of Marin outside of the ones that have received the evacuation warnings, which means essentially the coast from Inverness to Bolinas, uh, are not threatened by the Woodward fire. Um, I, the, now, fires are dynamic, those things can change, but right now that if you live in the, the Ross Valley or Nevada or San Rafael or Mount Tam Mill Valley community, you don't have anything to worry about. Um, that said, it is California, it's fire season. There are a number of uh, 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 extraordinarily large fires burning right now. Some of the largest fires that have ever burned in California history are burning within you know, 20 or so miles of you right now. So absolutely, you need to be prepared for anything. Uh, uh, prepared for a new fire, prepared for the existing fires to expand uh, you know, unexpectedly. That's something that we should always be ready for. Thanks. Uh, Santa Mar, was there a lot of incidents of what I would describe as neighbor helping neighbor during the evacuation in Paradise? We saw several examples of neighbors helping neighbors. I mean, starting with us, we, our um, closest neighbor, the husband wasn't willing to evacuate. He was that guy on the roof that Todd told you not to be. And his wife wanted to leave and she actually came with us. Um, another elderly person called 911 and said, and we heard this story later from another neighbor said, what do I do, what do I do? And they said, just go out, out in front of your house and hope for a ride. And she did and she got out and she's fine. We, one more story related to this is um, right in front of us, we saw a car completely packed, break down. Everybody jumped out. It's not a high socioeconomic area fight in large amount. And so this car breaks down, everybody jumps out, pushes the car off the road. And Darren and I are like, I guess we'll get ready to, to throw some of our stuff out and bring them in. But they knew the people in the car in front of them and, and they somehow all squished into that car. So. Um, more often than not, we saw a lot of people helping each other. There were some stories of people not helping each other, but um, they weren't nearly as common. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we're getting, we're at 7.30 now, so we're, it's time for us to wrap up. I realize there's still questions that have not been responded to, but as I said, give us a few days and all of those questions will be responded to in writing. You can access on our website. Some of the questions have to do with things that will be in future webinars. And Santa Mar's last answer kind of sets up next month's webinar, which is all about community organizing, neighbors helping neighbor, how we can make that happen, how you can get yourself organized, and how we can help motivate people to help each other in times of crisis. It'd be a very exciting webinar, and I hope you all be able to tune in. I really want to thank Todd and Santa Mar both. Really appreciate um, great presentations by them. Wish we could stay on for longer questions, but it's been kind of a long day. Todd's been out on the fire line all day and Santa Mar has a lot of duties to attend to. So I do also want to thank all the attendees. It's been fantastic that you've taken your time to do this. This will be recorded and available both on our YouTube channel and on our website. And hopefully for your friends who may have missed it, let them know and you can check into it. And we look forward to seeing all of you next month. I want to thank you again very much. Take care now. Be safe. Thanks, everyone.